everybody. My name is Debbie Montgomery Johnson, and this show is all about each and every one of us standing up and being our very best. Many of us have something, something we're hiding, something we're ashamed of, something that through no fault of our own or through our own making, we keep hidden, and that in turn keeps us hidden from each other and the world. Good people go through terrible situations. Wise people know when and how to let it go. Everything that happens to us helps us grow. While it may be hard to see it right away, the most important thing to do is to change your perception about your circumstances. Stand Up and Speak Up features ordinary people who have been through extraordinary struggles and found the courage to step up and out from behind their smiles and speak up about their experiences and the lessons gleaned from these experiences. Today we have a friend of mine who is a social media and a publishing rock star. She comes from Western Florida, but and that's where she is right now. But we'll get her stories about her successes in her business, but some of the things maybe that she's kept hidden over the past. So I want to introduce you to my friend, Tammy, Tamara Patzer. She's the creator, producer, and host of Women Innovators. And Miss Tammy, are you here? I'm here. Hey, Debbie. How are you? Hey. Great. Thank you so much for being our guest today. It's, it's fun to catch up. And uh, I, we were just talking a little bit about social isolation and not really seeing anybody, but speaking to people on the phone. So thank you for being my guest on the phone today. Oh, it, it's great. I'm happy to be here and excited to, um, I guess, be the woman behind the smile. <laughs> Well, I'm looking at your picture, and it's got such a beautiful smile on it. It's it's hard to you know to think that we're hiding behind them, but we all we all hide every day. We hide. Uh, right now, we're hiding behind masks. Um, and I think we had talked too about going to the grocery store. What's your experience about going to the grocery store with a mask on right now? Um, well, when I go to the gro- grocery store with a mask, the the main thing I notice is that some people are not wearing masks. And I do wear one, and the reason I do it is really out of respect for all the other people because I don't know, you know, what I'm running around carrying. But um, what I notice, I have some selfies of myself with my mask, and how I got my mask was uh, through a local seamstress. Her name is Linda Mercer, and She's actually made almost 5,000 face masks, and she's giving them away free. So that's how I got my mask. Um, I got it. I don't even know. It's probably been a month now. But um, what I I really like is, you know, I feel real stylish (laughs) because my (laughs) mask is a color with fish on it. So um that's one of the things, you know, I can make a fashion statement while going to the grocery store. But um, I noticed that for the most part, people, you know, there's still the people at the grocery store are still friendly. And I can still tell people are smiling behind the mask, you know, and they're glad to be out, you know, even if it's just the grocery store. Right. Well, you can tell a person's eyes, you know, by the, if they're smiling, you can tell by their eyes because their eyes shine yeah. and smile. Um, but I found that I have, and I had this discussion with a friend the other day about, uh, we were talking about Amazon and how extraordinary, extraordinary it has become and um, how we change our, our buying habits because of what's happened. And I found myself I'm on Amazon every other day or on Publix having it delivered. I I'm not scared to go out. I've just found it so convenient to have stuff brought to me. And I think that's an interesting, you know, change in the way we're going to shift how we do things going forward, which kind of brings me to what you do. I'm going to talk about, you know, your business at first so that we can put that out there so people know who you are. Because I put it on Facebook this morning. I'm like, Google Tammy Patzer. Because it's a wowza. That's all I can say. It was wowza, you know, <laughs> stuff you've done. It's extraordinary. And I met you, we go back a couple of years to yeah. California when we were roommates in California, and I really didn't know who you were. And I was kind of out there just in a fog doing my thing at the California Women's Conference, and I had no idea the 
the influence you have in the media world. So can you kind of tell our folks what you do and how you do it? And it, we're going to go to how do you become a rock star in that, in that industry, a rock star expert in your industry? Okay. Well, um, gee, I, you know, it's funny because I should have this down, you know. Who am I? Uh, well, I really help mostly women uh, tell their story, share their big messages and their big missions through what I would call like a, almost a hybrid system because it's, a, it's literally I help them grow their authority footprint so that they can become whoever they are and that might be through book publishing, that might be through podcasts, press releases, social media, uh, just everything that falls under that media umbrella. And what makes me so different than many people is that I actually have that educational foundation in mass communications. I was a mass communications professor at the University of South Florida. And then I was a newspaper editor and a TV producer. And then I became a book publisher when book publishing actually became easy for people to do. And, and I, I hesitate to say the word easy because that's a misnomer. People think that everything I do is just like simple and, and easy. But the fact is I have you know, years going back to the third grade, the Girl Scouts, when I started writing for the Girl Scout News. So it, it's basically what I would say I do is I help people to grow their authority footprint and to have what I call blue ocean authority. And if you've ever read the book or heard of the blue ocean strategy, it's basically all about becoming the only choice. The only choice out of all of the possibilities, even if the possibility is nothing, that you rise up and it's like, oh, my goodness, um, that person is the one, the expert. Um, they, you know, that's what I'm trying to help people accomplish. Um, and just like you, you know, you've had this phenomenal ride of going from, you know, speaking at that um, women's conference in California and then ending up on Oprah and Tamron and the Mel, the Mel show and, you know, all of these really cool things. You are a really good example of somebody who did what I actually help people do. Well, and that's extraordinary because um, we didn't work together before. I, I watched you and then I, I, my story was a little bit different. It just kind of took off because of the topic. But how would someone you know, that might have a story or have something that's happened to them that they want to share, how do you get them to speak up and to get the courage to work with you and then get it out there on local TV or in the print and then go national? Well, it, it really all starts with a conversation. Because sometimes we think we have to tell the most god-awful story that we've got in us, but the truth is we don't have to tell the worst story we have. We might actually have a story that we can start with. So it really just starts with a conversation, and then you have to feel comfortable and have trust to be able to share that. And then what most of us find, um, and I know that this happened for you, is that when you revealed it, all, you realized, oh my goodness, I have support. People aren't going to shun me. They're actually going to embrace you because you have a message that is so important because if it happened to you, it probably happened to other people. And I always think, to myself that I represent at least a thousand people <laughs> with my opinion. And, and so that's how I sometimes will ask myself questions. You know, when I come up with an idea, I go, well, if I think this, will a thousand other people think it? Because that's how they do polls. 
Um, they'll ask a thousand people and then they'll say, this is what everybody thinks. But I think that for most of us, the reason we don't share our stories is because we're afraid of people won't like us. We're, we have the shame resulting and sometimes we don't even realize that what happened to us is valuable for other people to know. But a lot of the time, I think that shame factor is really strong. So if you have a story that you want to tell, you really want to, you know, talk to somebody and you don't have to tell all the details of it. It may just be, you know, part of your story that where the lesson is, and then you can expand on that because again, podcasting is exploding. TV, people, you know, want to know what's going on, writing books, um, just creating these, this online footprint. And back to the idea of the story, your story does not have to be anything that is traumatic you, your story might be gee uh, like me um i sold night crawlers when i was 15 because i wanted to um, go on a trip to disneyland and i found i had gold in my own backyard which were night crawlers and i <laughs> sold them so that's actually you know that's an entrepreneurial story that says oh, she's got other, she's kind of creative. She's a creative thinker because I saw something, you know, worms laying on the ground and it was like, oh my God. And then it was like, ding, ding, ding. Um, you use night crawlers to catch fish. I live on Main Street. Maybe I can sell worms. And, and then I, I talked to my mom and she helped me figure it out you know, and that became a really good business. Um, publishing. Um, I was doing podcasting with my women innovators and I did 150 shows and I was desperate. I was like, oh my God, I'm not making any money. I might have to go get a J-O-B. <laughs> and so I yelled at God, you know, dear God, give me an answer. I woke up the next day and it was write a post on Facebook and say you're writing a book called Women Innovators, Leaders, Makers, and Givers, Women Who Make a Daily Difference. Do you want to be part of this? And the answer was yes. I had 64 women between Saturday morning and Sunday night send me the yes, and I sent them the information, and all of a sudden, I had a publishing business. Wow. So, so it's interesting to me that all of us have these big messages and big missions inside of us and all we need is just that one little let's call it a kick <laughs> to allow ourselves to become whoever we are well and i found too that it's the the support that you get from the people around you that you trust and then you have to get to the point where the naysayers aren't holding you back. Yes. Because I got early on, I was at a WPN meeting, and I came out with my story for the first time. And, well, it may, might, have, may, might have been the second time. But anyway, there was one woman sitting there, and she gave me what I called the stink eye. And I'm looking at her going, oh, my gosh. I'm thinking, well, I really wish this doesn't happen to you, but something will to you in your life and I didn't would want it to hold me back because I knew there were more people out there that needed to hear the story than just her and I didn't want her to stop me you know but I could have and when I had the, a newspaper article written one of my girlfriends wrote to me and she goes don't read what they're saying about you don't read what they're saying about the story and I didn't and I learned from that point on don't read what the bottom feeders say about you because it doesn't matter. Right. Well, that's true because um, me, and it's funny because, well, it's not really funny, but I spend a lot of time, um, you know, behind the computer, hiding behind the computer, 
uh, not having friends, not trusting people, because my experience out in the real world was people will stab you in the back. Like, like I've had people who didn't like me because they couldn't understand my creative thinking. They couldn't understand why I would be excited about this. Like what I do, imagine having somebody, like you just said, they give you that stink eye or they literally try to sabotage you just because you're smart and you have ideas that they don't have. So they get jealous and you can't allow that. WPN, the Women's Prosperity Network, when I um, found them or they found me, it was through Sharonada Pollock. She actually invited me uh, to help her when she was going to have a booth and speak. Well, when I got there, Sharonada was running around telling everybody, oh, my God, Tammy is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I was terrified because it's like she was telling people that I was this wonderful, wonderful person, yet I didn't believe it myself because I had had that same experience that you just said. Other people in my life had shut me down. Um, I even got fired from my newspaper got job. It wasn't that I got fired. It was when I gave notice because I because I needed more money and they kept promising me they were going to give me a raise, but they never did. And so I went and found a better job and I gave 14 days notice and said, I will train whoever comes in behind me um, so that you there's a smooth transition. Instead, they escorted me to the door. <laughs> and so I was like, the, and I'm like, what were they afraid of? that I was going to tell people, oh, they don't keep their promises, that they were underpaying me because I was a woman. I wasn't going to cause any trouble. Now I tell the world because they, they literally escorted me to the door and everyone, they made it appear as if I had done something wrong. When in fact, all I did was do the right thing, which was I went and found a better job. I gave 14 days notice and, and said, I will train anyone who follows me. So I, I literally, um, I could never go back to work <laughs> in a J-O-B because I figured out I don't have to allow anybody to treat me like that and that my ideas it's great that I have all these creative ideas because I can help other people and get them seen and found. So every good idea I ever have, I help my clients. I say, oh, let's do this. And even if they don't understand what I'm talking about, I said, you don't have to understand. Just let me do my thing. And then they're like, oh, that worked. <laughs> so it's pretty exciting. But that trust factor um, it doesn't matter, you know, um, if it's something like what happened to me where, you know, you, you, you're faithful, you're loyal, you, you're, you know, towing the line, you're company. And then they say, oh, because we don't want to pay you, even though we promised, we're going to go ahead and make everybody think that you're bad, that we let you go when, in fact, I made the choice. And that probably happens to people because and I think you know, I'm sorry, sometimes that that action that is taken by someone else, looking back at it was might might have been one of the best things that ever happened to you. Oh yeah, I've had a lot of really um, <laughs> I guess good bad things happen to me be, because. Um, and, and that goes with maybe you're working with a client and they're unhappy, but they were the worst client ever because they didn't, they wouldn't under, do anything. And they say, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. So you should be jumping up and down because they drain your energy. And you want to work with my rule now is that I only work with people who really, really appreciate me and love me and do what I say. And uh, that has made all the difference 
for me because I don't work with just anybody. If, if I don't think that they're really um, appreciating me, I don't want to work with them because it took me a lot of pain and energy and education and money to learn all the things that I've learned. Um, and it's just like you with what happened to you. That was an education that cost you not only emotional energy, it cost real tangible money and time, uh, you know, and we never get that back, but we certainly can build on it and help other people. Right, and it was a catalyst to what we can do today, but I'm like you too. If they, I mean, I, we're here to assist people to help them become better, um, but we can't fix them. Right. And the negative energy from some people, I, I've only had a couple um, in the past couple of years, but it just sucked the life out of me. And I, I don't like people not liking me, but there are a couple of people that I've got to the point where I'm like, you know what, I just can't be around you. I can't engage with you because you're not good for my health. Right. And, and that's tough because those are the people I think about. And, you know, we, we want to fix them. And I was like, nope, can't fix this one. So I just got to disengage. It's tough. It is hard. To, it is hard to disengage, especially when it's like family members. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that's always especially. The, That's the hardest because you can't just go, you know, out. You have to figure out a way to to maintain those relationships. Anyway, that's how I feel about it. You know, some people just disown people and that's not my method with, with family. I figure I can disown people that are not related, but I can't disown, you know, my children or, or other people, you know, that are blood relatives. No, that's important. And you've got to work through those relationships. And part of that especially if you've had something happen in your life that you've been ashamed of or afraid of, is actually speaking out to those family members and explaining to them what happened. And I found yeah. a lot of women, especially, haven't wanted to do that because they're afraid of what the family's going to think. Right. Well, for me, for example, I was in a really bad relationship for like, let's, I don't even know anymore, I lost count, like 20 years. And uh, my family didn't know about any of the bad stuff that went on. Um, and I, you know, you go back because, like, for example, this was when I, I had children, you know, little children. And we're brought up with, oh, you want to make sure that your children have a relationship with their father you don't want to um, create negative feelings. You have to be, um, you know, make sure that your kids know that their father is good, blah, blah, blah. And that may or may not be true. But for me, I actually was pregnant and we had an abusive situation happen. So I left and I was in hiding for six months. And during that time, I lost my job. I was pregnant. I had no furniture. Um, it was just this really awful, awful time. And I had to go to work at the grocery store. And I had been an executive producer of a TV show. So that was, for me, embarrassing. I was ashamed to see people at the grocery store. and. The part that's kind of funny as I look back at it is I, when you said that part about sometimes bad things become good, I was at the grocery store one day checking, and um, this grocery store, uh, it was so bad that the automatic um, conveyor belts didn't work. Mm -hmm. So you literally, you know, talk about carpal tunnel because you're doing, you know, hundreds of products. But one day, this woman came through the line, and it was somebody I knew. And it was like, oh, my God. You know, and then she goes, Tammy, my dad's been looking for you. He wants you to produce these videos for us. Because I had created this real estate TV show, and I had produced all these um 
VHS tapes back in the day that this man who owned this big um, community used to sell his community by sending VHS tapes out. And I had created those for him. So there I was embarrassed and ashamed to be working at the grocery store as a checker because that was so far away from who I had been as this producer video, you know, person. But this woman, she didn't see me as any less. She just said, oh, there's Tammy. My dad's been looking for you. And what happened, of course, was I contacted him and I no longer had to work at the grocery store because I was back doing what I knew how to do back at that higher level. But I was very ashamed of that because for it was not who I was. And, and the part about that is when I see people working at the grocery store, I don't think anything negative about the fact they're checking out my groceries or helping me. I, it, it, I don't even equate it to anything other than, oh, if they were nice to me, then that's all. But for me personally, because I knew who I had been and where I was, that was a big source of shame for me. Um, and I never tell people about that. But I mean, it's interesting today, we look at our, our the checkout girls and guys at the grocery store as the heroes. I know. You know for being at the store in this pandemic. You know? Right, and that's the truth. It, I mean, it, that's why it's all about who we think we are and that's actually part of what i do the first one of the first things i do with my clients is we actually will brainstorm all of our achievements all of our successes and even all of our things that are not successes so that we can actually start to see who we are and that's how we actually can figure out which stories to tell. And that is actually really important because there's some stories that depending on the situation, we shouldn't be telling. Um, you know, if it doesn't relate to what we're, why we're speaking. So, but most of us, like earlier, I talked about my night crawler story and then I just talked about, gee, I was in hiding for six months because of bad stuff and being embarrassed. So those stories at certain times may or may not be appropriate to tell. And that's also something that we always try to figure out, too, is what stories should we be telling and when? Because it's like having a, a toolbox of, of different um personas or personas that we can um, use but in the everyday thing like like in book publishing for example with my women innovators uh, the stories in those books were women innovators leaders makers and givers women who make a daily difference and the interviews were all about what they were doing that was making a difference in the world and so most of those stories, they weren't uh, anything, they weren't telling any deep, dark secrets. But then there are other books where people talk about the lowest of low things and how they came up. And now they're, they're doing something phenomenal um, with their life. Because the truth is, every single person we all have a mission and a message and a purpose, and we just sometimes we just need help to find out, you know, what, did it, what is it that I bring to the world that is so unique to me that I can help other people. And sometimes we, as the listeners, find out of the find out about those stories just by listening and going back to uh, to the grocery store i remember a couple of years ago Publix down here in south florida uh employs a lot of older folks and a lot of um 
disabled folks and it's really amazing if you just if you look at them as people and and our friend nancy matthews and the one philosophy every time i go to the grocery store i'm thinking now nancy would say say hi to the person and call them by name you know and get to know that person by name so take a take a moment to breathe get off your telephone when you're at the getting checked out but i remember this one gentleman it was he was a bagger and he's probably 75 80 years old and we just started talking because he wanted to take my groceries out. And I, you know, I was in my 50s. I didn't really need him to take my groceries out. But he was just a sweet old man. And we started talking, and they saw the military um, magnets on the back of my car. And it turned out that he was a retired Army colonel that just didn't want to be retired anymore. And he loved working at Publix. And I... I watched him over the year on in how people re, you know communicated with him or didn't and i'm thinking he is such a gem and when he and i started talking we had so much in common because of my military background and my kids i'm like you know what if i hadn't talked to him i wouldn't know his story and he has a story to tell and we need to be grateful for that and and like you i didn't look at him like oh it's just a bag boy i'm like this is a this is a hero you know, who, who wants to be out in the world still. Yeah. And, and I think there's so many people out there that, that are heroes that we just don't know about. And in your industry, you know, I really admire what you do in getting those people to speak up and to get it out there. And uh, so you had one thing that you, had, you wanted to, um, to share. It was the three tips to use the six-figure – what was it? Three tips to use for six-figure podcast guesting opportunities. I know we do a lot of podcasts, and they're usually free. So yes. Well, for here's what it is: is most people. You're absolutely right. Most guest pod podcast guesting opportunities are free to get on, and where people fail to monetize them is because they don't have what's called a call to action to give, let's say, a free gift, for example. So that would be one of the tips. It would be have something that you can give away to people so that when your host asks you, um, you know, where can people get in contact with you, you can easily say, oh, I've got a free gift for you. So I might say, I have a free um, podcast guest checklist for you. Text Tammy, T-A-M-I, to 64600. That's a call to action. Or it could be a call to action to your website and a gift. You don't want to just send somebody just to your website because, you know, they'll get there and it's like, what am I going to do here? And if, but if you have a specific action for them to take, that can lead to getting that person's name and email and then, of course, you can nurture that relationship with a follow-up email campaign once they've asked for that free gift. So that could lead to them buying your products or your services. So, so that's a tip. An another tip would be to research the podcast that you're going to be on so that you know about the host, know about, you know, the type of podcast it is. And also most podcasts live on Apple or Stitcher or Spreaker or, or, or wherever. Go and listen to at least two or three of the, the podcast um, episodes so that you can understand them and then leave a review for that podcast uh, after you listen to it. And then also make sure that you like that podcast host stuff. And if you are invited to be a guest, obviously you want to share the fact that you're going to be a guest on the show and act like you're excited about it. I mean, I was really excited about being a guest on your show because I'm like, uh, you know, I knew Debbie, we were roommates, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I, when. <laughs> you know, and I, and I, and I want to interview you about your journey, you know, and because of 
of the fact that you had a very specific topic for your book and, you know, you kind of just allowed yourself to ride the wave, you know, it led to, to really big things for you. So show appreciation to the podcast host and the show and make sure that after you have been on someone's podcast that you, number one, not only share your episodes, but share the other episodes, talk it up, be that advocate for all the different shows because it isn't a, it isn't just about you. It really is about you participating. And when you do that, it's going to help you do a few things like grow your online authority footprint because the more you share it, the more that podcast is going to actually help you and help you to attract those ideal clients or, or those clients who will pay you for your products and services. And the third thing is about repurposing. And a lot of people, they fail to repurpose their authority. For example, um, you've been on uh, Dr. Oz, you've been on different shows, on Tamron, on the Mel show, all of these different shows. You should make sure that you're repurposing, that you're, you're constantly sharing those over and over again, those um, videos. Mm -hmm. And, of course, put them on your website and do all of that. And most people, the reason they don't share and repurpose is they think everybody's already seen it. And then it goes back to that factor of, oh, my goodness, I don't want people to think that I'm um, a snob or I have an ego and everything like that. Number one, it goes to the point of who cares <laughs> and it's okay because you do have that credibility. You do have that authority because you appeared on Dr. Oz and, and Tamron and the Mel show and ABC, NBC and the Palm beach post and, and all of those places, not to mention all of the, other shows, the podcasts you've been on. And so that's important. And then another thing is, and I'll give two more just because I, I think they're really important. So it's not three tips, but five. Um, write press releases about everything you're doing, because when you do, it will fill up the Google search, the Bing search, the Yahoo search, with not only the press pickups, but with links back to you and your um, whatever your services are, your website, your social media. So you'll get found more and people will say, oh, my goodness, you're out there everywhere. Just like you said to me, like, wow, you're out there everywhere. Um, because I use the power of press releases and press release distribution and then um, my the fifth one that I wanted to say is that you can easily um, turn this content from a podcast, transcribe it, and there you go. You've got tons and tons of information that you can put into blog posts. You can strip the video and audio out and share audio snippets. Um, there's just so much you can do with one podcast appearance that can lead to six figures because once you're out there and you're attracting people and, and you're creating that relationship with through your email or through your social media and people say, oh, I want to buy that, you will start to make money from that and it can lead to a lot of money. And most people um, who are using podcasting today to help them become a six-figure earner, they're doing, you know, 
they have it as part of their marketing plan and they're doing all the things that I just said. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting as you were talking there and, and about the repurposing and, and doing the press releases and researching the podcast. It's all great stuff and, and trying to get out there in a way. And, and it's funny, I go back to a few years ago when I was getting my book out for the first time and we were, we were trying to do Messenger. You know, I was messaging my friends on, on Facebook. And one person who's not in my circle of influence anymore, came on and in a really nasty message said, you'd do anything for a buck. And it was literally 97 cents. And I'm like, really? You just said that to me? I'm trying to get the story out and you blast me because you think I want to make it 97 cents? I just lost a million dollars. I could use your help, but I didn't get it. Um, but, and then you start thinking, well, yeah, everybody knows the story. Everybody's heard it. And then you realize that, no, you're, there's billions of people in the world, and they've not heard your story. And exactly. they need to. They need to. Maybe a million need to. Maybe a hundred need to. But if we don't get it out there, no one will hear it. Well, so, the scammer situation is not uh, – I mean, they're still out there. Oh, I, get, I bet I get five to ten fake profile invites every single day. And um, it's funny because I, I am not anyone that would ever have a relationship with somebody like on the internet because of my trust factor. I don't trust people in real life. So, so why would I trust you online? Um, you know, because that is something that you really do have to be aware of. Um, and often they'll, they'll start out, oh, you're so beautiful, or I love your smile. To me, that says scammer. If, if somebody says that to me, and even if they were legit, I, I would never believe them. So I immediately mark them as spam and block them because um, I just don't trust that anybody in reality would ever – um, approach me like that, you know, to say, oh, you're so beautiful. I love your smile. You, you know, I just, to me, that's like red flag 101. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to tell you that I love your smile. I'm looking at your picture right here. And it's just so engaging. But well, that's kind of I know good... you. <laughs> it's a good segue. I do. I, I always like to bring in Dr. Tim McGinnis from the founder of SCARS. And, um, and that's a great segue into Tim's se segment. And then we're going to bring Tammy back at the end just to thank you and to give you your call to action and let, you, you know, to let people know how to get a hold of you. But Dr. Tim, I, I, are you there? I am. Hey, Tim, um, what Tammy just said is really important, you know, and, and you're going to talk about something that I was asking my son about this morning. He goes, never heard of that, Mom. So can you please give us a moment in uh, what's new in the world of scams today? Well, based upon your, your guest um, and, and your conversation, I thought we would talk a little bit about manipulation because some of the same techniques that are used by scammers are also prevalent techniques that are used by um, domestic abuse partners, for example. One of these techniques is something known as gaslighting. The name comes from an old Alfred Hitchcock movie. I think it was 1939. But the idea is basically that over a period of time, you systematically manipulate another person's perception of reality by feeding them with a, a long stream of, of information about uh, their place in the world, their role, their skills, their strengths, their weaknesses, etc., so that you're essentially molding the way they see themselves and they see the world around them. Uh, people that are in, a, in an abusive relationship are frequently gaslighted by their partner. Uh, they use that as a as a manipulative technique to hold them in a uh, a relationship that any normal thinking person would just look at and be aghast. Same exact thing goes on in scams. Once you open the door to the scammer, their manipulative skills begin to take over the relationship, and 
all of those little things like even the introductory messages that, hi, you have a great smile, all of these compliments. You know, when, when it happens in a bar, you just automatically look at a person and walk away for those opening lines. But when it happens in an email, strangely the impact is quite different because none of the normal protective techniques come into play. So the result is, is that scammers, while not being rocket scientists, have a natural ability to manipulate their victims by starting off giving them a, an endless stream of compliments and complementary uh, relationship statements. They will do the occasional amygdala hijack bombs where you know, they'll drop a, a few things to trigger a very specific emotional response over the duration of the scam, it's always about gaslighting the person to get them to both believe the reality that the scammer is spinning and also to self-isolate so that it limits the ability of outsiders, third parties, families, and friends to interject in this person's behavior and start questioning what's going on and introducing doubt. That's exactly the same kind of thing that every abusive spouse or partner does as well. You, they want to isolate their, their victim, so to speak, from family and friends because family and friends can inject reality into the situation and make that victim doubt what's really going on and open their eyes about the scam. So it's important to recognize that all scams, all confidence schemes, by their very nature, involve manipulation. And those same manipulative techniques apply whether it's a, a con game that's being played against a person in real life, whether it's being used for a more sinister, darker purpose to victimize a, uh, a loved one, or whether it's being used in the workplace. Because quite frankly, employers also engage in a steady stream uh, propagandizing manipulation to hold their employees in place. Now, certainly this is not all companies. As someone who has hired thousands of people over the years and run multi-billion dollar companies, I've always been a believer in truth, even when it's painful truth. Giving people the opportunity to make informed decisions is better than going smoke so to speak, gaslighting. So when looking at scams in general of any nature, the single most important thing is, is the scammer overcompensating with complementary dialogue? This is a clear indication of gaslighting. Is the scammer trying to isolate the victim, giving them various stories about friends and family, how they won't understand, how they won't approve, whatever the narrative may be. But any attempt at isolation of creating wedges between the victim and other people that they trust is gaslighting. And these manipulative techniques, once you become aware of their existence, you can look for them, and you'll find that they're all around you. Today's news media is incredibly proficient at gaslighting their audience in both using deceptions, sometimes minimal, sometimes very overt, using fear-mongering as an attempt. Fear-mongering, by the way, is by definition gaslighting. Hmm. When you're not being told the truth, when you're being fed a steady stream of amplified negativity and fear, that's a form of gaslighting. It helps isolate you from others who may share differing views, but at least you can have a conversation with. So these are all critically important things to recognize about scams in all of their various forms that play on people's base motivations, greed, desire, fear of loneliness, whatever it may happen to be, to achieve a scammer's result, which usually will result in a demand for money in one way or another, because ultimately that's what the scammer lives on. 
That's true. Thank you, Tim. That's so great. And it takes me back to last week, and, and the, the tip last week was basically stop, think, and connect. So, you know, and Tammy, I want to bring you back in real quick because this goes back to, to engaging in business with people you may not know is really you've got to stop and look if it's, if it's that shiny object, if it seems too good to be true, hold off. Talk to somebody. You know, trust is a big thing in your business. Yes. And ha- real quick, have you had, up, have you had times in, in your career where people have come to you and it just seemed too good and you had to stop, think, and then maybe disconnect um, before you engaged? I, I actually um, have had many situations where things appeared to be too, too good. And yes, I think that's really good advice to, to really evaluate um, and stop and think. Just the other day, I had this person um, online and I, I just put a message out talking about the value of podcasting, for example, and this man started to say things like in, um, in the post like that he was interested. And when I said, well, if you want answers, you know, I'll make an appointment with you and we can talk because I personally don't believe that you can really uh, get a lot of really clear answers in a text or an email. And I personally prefer to use like a Zoom call so I can see people and talk to them, and this man wouldn't, like, actually talk to me. And the more he talked in the messaging, I realized that he was just fishing for information, and so I just blocked him. Uh, You know, I'm to the point where in the online world, um, if somebody won't talk to me, like, in a face-to-face, like, via Zoom, so that we can actually create a real relationship and I can answer real questions, I just literally will disconnect, block them and say next. And, and I think this works not only in business, but it in, in real life, um, we just have to be more discerning, especially when we meet people in the online world, because like photographs, for example, you know, how old is that photograph that somebody might post? Um, I try to keep mine up to date, um, but I know people that, you know, they're posting photos that are 20 years old. Mm-hmm. So you might have a, a, you know, you're not really getting a real story or the things that people post online may or may not be actually 100% factual. So I personally, with the people I work with, I like to talk to them and answer all their questions and start small instead of doing something really, really big so that they can get a feeling of, oh, this is how this works. So So, if somebody wants to, to work with you after hearing what we've talked about, how do they get a hold of you? How best to connect? The best way to connect is actually, um, you know, unlike some people who say, you know, go here, I actually like a personal email um, so that they can tell me, you know, what they want so we can make a schedule. So they can send that to Tammy, T-A-M-I, social media at Gmail, and they could just say, hey, I heard you on um, the woman behind the smile and one of the things that I like to send to people which is uh, a physical book and if they ask for it I'll send it it's called ask Tammy what you need to know about generating leads and positioning yourself as the expert with your book it's actually a little book where I answer all the questions that I could think of and I'll send that and in today's world you know, why wouldn't you want to get a nice piece of mail? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, so they can ask for that um, also because it'll answer some questions. And if they have any specific questions about podcasting, about books, about authority, you know, feel free to just say, hey, um, I was curious about this. Can we talk? 
and then I can send them a schedule link and we can talk at their convenience because I, I like to talk to people so, so I know what they really need or where they're at. I don't have a blanket answer for, for a lot of this stuff, um, you know, because every person is um, customized, I guess, in, in my view. Everyone has their own separate message and mission and a starting point and the only way I can tell where that is is to actually have a conversation so it's Tammy T-A-M-I social media at gmail that's great and we, we will post that later on uh, when we have the replay of this go out so Tammy thank you so much for all of your great information and for your stories and for some things that I learned today that I didn't know about you and that's the <laughs> point of that's the point of our stand up and speak up series and thank you, Dr. Tim, uh, the founder of SCARS. You can reach SCARS uh, at romancescamsnow.com. And there's an incredible amount of information out there uh, about families and children and all sorts of, you know, everybody is, is subject to being um, gaslighted or, or scammed. And uh, we want to keep it on the up and up, but we just want to be able to get it, the word out there to educate people. Um, also, this episode has been sponsored by benfocomplete.com a vitamin supplement company that supports people with neuropathy. I happen to be, you know, very involved with that, and, uh, and it's an important uh, vitamin supplement uh, for folks with neuropathy. I want to thank everybody for being here. We're going to stop the, um, the show in a moment, but we will stay on for, for questions and answers if anybody would like to stay on after that. And again, thank you. We're here every Thursday morning at 9 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time. We look forward to having people share their stories so they can stand up, speak up, and I like to say woman up. And uh, we're going to make sure that everybody that is out there becomes a victor, not a victim. Let's show them how to be awesome and not angry and acknowledge what's happening and forgive ourselves first and then move on with power. Please go to thewomanbehindthesmile.com, download your free seven steps to standing up in your power, and join us on our Facebook group, Stand Up and Speak Up. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.